Welcome to the Beyond the Bucket Show, a podcast centered around optimizing all lives' buckets. We all have buckets we are balancing, coaching, entrepreneurial ventures, family, passion projects, and health. Let's all take this journey together and become bucket fillers. And here's your host, Chris McSwain. Eric Scherenberg is the Vice President of Athletics and Physical Education for Valley Christian Schools, located in San Jose, California. In his tenure with the school, he has elevated the athletics department to state and national prominence. Valley Christian's teams, athletes, and coaches have been recognized at a state and national level on numerous occasions over the last decade for their accomplishments. Eric has seen it all in his 20 plus year career as an administrator, coach, and parent. He shares with us his unique perspective on success, leadership, and managing such a large operation. Enjoy this rare look into one of the best in his field. Before we start, if you have 60 seconds after this podcast is over, please make sure to subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast with your friends. Helps me bring on more guests to help us all become better bucket fillers. Also, follow me at Chris underscore underscore McSwain on Instagram and Twitter. I'd love to hear from you. Now let's get to the show. Eric Scherenberg, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Good to be with you, Coach. So we get to uh, reverse roles just here a little bit, and I uh, get, to, get to do the interviewing. So I'm excited to get your story. There's so much about you that people may not know. You know, because of your position right now, um, some, you're somewhat insulated at times because you kind of have to be. Uh, but I'm very excited to have this conversation and let everybody else know kind of who you are, what you stand for, how you got to where you're at. You know, you've got a pretty cool position to be able to see, you know, youth athletes become, you know, high school athletes and beyond. And the way that you're able to, you know, touch their lives in so many different ways, I just think it's uh, very impressive and uh, really excited to have you. Um, so just a little bit, I, I want to get a breakdown of who you are, uh, where'd you grow up I know you've been in the in the Catholic and 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 private school sector for so long um, but you know tell me a little bit about your upbringing yeah so so growing up um, again we were born and raised here in Silicon Valley and uh, and you know my parents were the family that you know they're married in their late teens early 20s and mm -hmm. we had four four of us in uh, in five years there so we just sort of kind of grew up together uh, making our way through um, you know just making our way through playing sports, being a team uh, all the way through. And my dad was an only child. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, he wanted, a, he wanted a team around him right away. So that's how we grew up. We, you know, 10 years with the four of us. And, and then uh, my mom ended up going back to college and becoming a lawyer about 10 years later. Along that time, we had, you know, another brother and sister come. So now it was six of us, you oh, know, wow. just kind of, uh, you know, running our way through. And that, that lasted, uh, for another 10 years and they adopted you know two from a russian orphanage but uh um so so i'm one of those guys with you know seven brothers and sisters all of us pretty much uh you know local in this area and have been here so um you know went to saint francis high school growing up and and uh and that's where all of us went and and just you know that was our that was our upbringing upbringing playing sports you know club sports didn't really exist in those days sure. uh, at least certainly not as the way now but uh but we were surrounded by people who were pouring into us. And so it was just right. football, basketball, baseball, um, you know, all the time. Wow. And you were a three-sport athlete in high school? I was. And, uh, and, and all the way through. And really, it was just a great way to grow up. It's, it's informed a lot of, uh, of just the athletic side of, of, of who we are. You know, we just, we really, we learned to compete at a young right. age. That was, it was just a different world kind of, everything was about the competition um, and again, that was happening in, in the sport didn't matter. We were competing everything we did in our team sports and, uh, and then in the neighborhood, you know, my dad used to always like to send us out in the neighborhood looking for another family to play mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and just go, my kids can be your kids type of thing. And, and so, so we grew up <laughs> and, uh, and that would be, that would be all we would do, um, really from sun up to sundown and, and nothing, you know, nothing really, uh, nothing really ever changed. 
Right. So athletics has kind of always been in your family, which I think is great. It teaches you so many different lessons uh, about life and competition. That's what I really love uh, as far as your comments go. Uh, but tell me a little bit about how you got to where you're at. You know, you're uh, the vice president of athletics at Valley Christian Schools, K through 12. And there's probably, you know, a long process that goes to get to that point. But give me kind of the Cliff Notes version. So, so, so quickly, I mean, a lot of it was through coaching. I, you know, I got out of school and, and decided to start coaching football and, uh, and just luckily just came into contact with great people. I coached at Foothill College for a year with uh, Marshall Spurbeck, mm. who went on to become the head coach at Sac State, went to yeah. Mountain View High School for, uh, for a couple years and, uh, and worked with an amazing staff led by Ray Calcano. And a guy named Doug Cosby actually came onto our staff then. And that was really uh, Doug. Doug played for the Cowboys for a number of years, and uh, and became later the the head coach at Menlo College. Oh. So that was kind of the next step. I was going to do the college coaching thing, and that was my plan. And uh, and so I worked as a, a defensive coordinator for Doug at Menlo for a year with this star-studded coaching staff. Tom Rathman was our offensive coordinator. Bill Walsh's son Craig was uh, our receivers coach, and Tina Turner was on the staff. Really? And, the team, you know, team had never hadn't won a game in like two years, and uh, and Doug came in and brought all this energy with all these people, and mm -hmm. uh, we got off to a great start. We went five and one to start. All of a sudden, Sports Illustrated's there. Bill Walsh is on the sidelines, and, and you sort of feel like, man, this is going to be my thing. It's going to be yeah. college coaching, and uh, and it went so well. Doug became the offensive coordinator at Cal Berkeley the next year, and uh, and I got my first lesson on what the college world is like. That you, you know everybody's got a guy. You, you know it doesn't last forever. Right. And so it was just sort of against that backdrop that uh, that when Doug went there and Tom went to the NFL with the 49ers, that uh, that I was out at uh, at Menlo, even though we had a lot of success. A random phone call to Mike Machado, who had just become the he had just become the head football coach at at Valley Christian, who in those days was a uh, we were a C League team in the Blossom Valley League, and and uh, and just not really playing at a high level. And right. so I was just going to do it for a year. I actually got married. The week after uh, the week after the Menlo thing sort of fell apart, so my wife, God bless her, right, just uh, still marrying me with uh, you know with no job and all that, but uh, yeah. but uh, but we started here at Valley and and did it for a year. I was working a number of odd jobs and group homes and special education places and uh, and and then the the second year I came back and uh, and we actually went to the championship game. Um, and that was a big turning point. We, uh, we, we beat, you know, the number one seed, we shut them out in the first round, shut out the number two or number, uh, yeah, two seed in the second round, or we shut a two and three seed, something like that. And then we played the number one seed in the championship game, Palma high school. And, uh, man, Chris, they, they must've beat us a hundred to nothing. It was, uh, oh. it was a debacle. We were yeah. in over our heads and, uh, it was one of those things where, you know, we, it was just a different level that we were playing at. And when we came back, we you know, our heads were, you know, our tails between our legs. We had just gotten beaten down. And uh, and we got a real lesson on Valley Christian, which was uh, it's more than just the winning and losing. The parents put together this incredible party for us in the gym that night. Sure. And uh, and it was just – it was, and so we were off. And from there, I, you know, I became a – you know, I helped oversee the move to the Skyway campus and, uh, you know, spent about – you know, Dr. Doherty called me into the office one day with sports. And, and, and you know, long story short, we – I traded jobs with the guy who was, I was doing the operations and the guy who was the athletic director, you know, Larry Nardi at the time, we traded jobs. His skill set matched the, the new job better than mine did, quite honestly. And, and yeah. hopefully I had some skill set for the athletic administration. And uh, and so that was it. I moved into that for, for that period of time and, and just sort of coincided with all that was going on with the WCAL. Ellie Christian joined the WCAL a year later. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so that was, that was my lead in to this incredible position. Interesting to, to kind of see the dynamics and uh, speak about being on the old, the, well, the current Branham campus and now coming and bringing the, this Valley Christian vision to the Skyway campus. And if anybody has ever been there, it's just an immaculate, immaculate uh, facility, but, the story behind the facility and how it all came together. Uh, Cliff Do or Dr. Cliff Doherty, you know, wrote a book about that entire process. So tell me what it was like from behind the scenes, you know, kind of helping lead that charge. 
Well, I certainly wasn't helping lead really, but I, I was a fly on the wall man of this incredible visionary leader. Dr. Doherty brought me up to the campus. Uh, you can see a little bit behind me there what the campus looks like now, yeah. but uh, it, w it wasn't like that then. It was just mountains. And he's like, well, this is where the football field's gonna be. And this is where the baseball field. And I just saw dirt. I'm like, I, I, I yeah. tell you, it was, it was a mountaintop. It's like, this is impossible. And, uh, and, and yet I got to be a part of, in my role in the school at that time, I got to sit in on these meetings with the construction meetings and watching these just incredibly brilliant men and women and, and learning the construction side. Uh, it was just, it was incredible to see. And just from a, from a faith standpoint, there were a lot of setbacks and a lot oh, yeah. of times where I remember the day I went into this construction meeting and the plan was to, to open up on this date. And, and the, the guy, the, the, the superintendent of the projects, like, Guys, we're not going to make it. Not only we're not going to make it, but we're you know some number of weeks, months behind. And I'm just like, wow, this is a disaster. You know, what are we going to do? And uh, and just watching thoughtful leaders in this environment where uh, it was scary, but they their faith well was tested. They they just they thought their way through it and they kept moving it forward. And so it was amazing. It was just amazing to see. I got to I actually got to lead the the transition of the move from the Skyway campus or from the Branham campus to the Skyway campus. I was the guy in charge of that yeah. mostly because everybody else was doing real work. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so they just, they said, get to, to work. work somehow. Yeah, exactly. You're doing this. So it's like, and, but in that time frame, I was able to show um, hopefully a, you know, help to form my work ethic, but also demonstrate it a little bit. I wasn't afraid of a challenge. I wasn't afraid to, um, to take a leadership role. And I mean, there weren't locks, there was no parking lots. The pool wasn't covered yet. I mean, it was a crazy time of, of right. risk, and uh, but I learned a lot about about not being afraid and just uh, and just being willing to make decisions sometimes in less than ideal circumstances. And now, like you say, we've got this amazing campus. I've got an amazing support structure, but it wasn't always that way. And and I learned a lot in that time about about just having faith and having confidence and doing the best with what you have and Definitely. moving it forward one step at a time. Absolutely. No, uh, I feel blessed to have an opportunity to work there. And, uh, you know, just the quest for excellence is the book or the title of the book by Dr. Clifford Doherty. Uh, beautiful story and a lot of twists and turns, but in the ultimate uh, finality of it all, it ends up working out. And that's why we're both here today. I know we're still working through it, but, uh, but so far so good. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, you mentioned the WCAL, the West Catholic Athletic League, one of the highly regarded leagues in the entire country. You have so many family mem members that are a part of this league. Tell me what that dynamic is about and that competition level, because I know you all want to win uh, to your to your previous point about competition. Tell me about how all that all works together for you and your family. So just a little bit of the background, you know, my oldest brother, Will, was the athletic director. He's taught at Archbishop Mitty for probably 30 years now. He was the athletic director for 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my sister, Ann, uh, her husband, Greg Calcagno, is the head football coach at St. Francis. His dad was our coach growing up. Wow. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I have my youngest brother, my, my younger brother, Matthew, is a teacher. and He's my next door neighbor, lives right across the street. And, uh, and he's, the, he's a teacher at St. Francis High School, the defensive coordinator mm -hmm. as well for their football team. So that's just a little bit, a quick look at, at some of the family dynamics there. But as you know, Chris, the, you know, the WCL is a family all the way through. I mean, so for sure. me, having been a player in the league, when I first came into it, everywhere I went, it was, uh, it was a family member somewhere. The, the legends of people that I grew up watching coach or, or guys right. that, I, that, I, that I played against um, you know, who, who are now the, the principal at Archbishop Reardon or, or you know, the head coach, at, at basketball coach at Sarah's. These, these are guys I grew up with. And, uh, right. and so everywhere you go, you're seeing guys and girls who are essentially family um, and these people who are my teachers who would, would ultimately, you know, I just see them everywhere. So, so from my perspective, people are always like, oh, what's it like to compete against your family? Um, I got family all over this league, and uh, sure. and that's been a beautiful part of of just being a part of, of such a special league. And not only that, my nephews and nieces have have all. I, I get a coach against them, so yeah. oftentimes I get to watch them play. Or am I going to kick it to my nephew in the football game, or uh, or watching my nieces play for field hockey championships, or uh, you know all that type of thing? It's been uh, that part's. It's just it's it's a cool part of the league. You know, we've come together. 
in my family for some special things. You know my niece Jennifer, we lost her to, to brain cancer when she yeah. was six years old. And, and uh, man, we have special nights around the league of people supporting that. And, you know, my dad had a cancer diagnosis about a year ago and, and we had, you know, a special night of, of, of that. And so some really powerful, special moments for our family in this athletic competition. But it's the simple stuff that's, that's, that's as fun as that. I mean, watching, I mean, we got a truckload of family at freshman football games, uh, you know, doing things or, you know, you see them at, at senior nights and, uh, and, and just the special events from, uh, from that sports and this league is, uh, it's, it's a part of our, uh, a part of our family. It, it, and that's one of the things that's so hard about this shutdown that we're in right now. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you this story that, you, you know, Zoom's become this big thing. I mentioned my brother, Matthew, who's across the street from me. Yeah. Well, he's playing his, his youngest son, Henry, in this garage basketball. They got their, their little hoop set up in the garage right now. Yep. And so they play every night, you know, garage basketball. And obviously, you know, it's, it's three games to three games. And he just put out to the family who wants to watch, you know, game seven of the Garage <laughs> Basketball Association. Right. And I'll tell you what, we had the biggest Zoom call. Uh, we almost broke the internet with uh, family coming from everywhere, watching Matthew and Henry in the garage basketball, you know, game seven. So it's, uh, it's just an example, like I told you before, of, uh, of, of the competition and the family environment of it. So, uh, you yeah. know, Henry beat Matthew. He, you know, my, my nephew won the garage basketball. He's the, the defending champion now uh, of the GBA. Uh, but, you know, we're looking for more competition once we get out there. Wow. What a great story. Speaking of Zoom, uh, Eric Juan, who is the CEO of Zoom, I used to coach his son in club basketball a few years ago, Roy. He was a prolific shooter at St. Francis, ironically. Yeah. So, uh, the, the we remember of- him, man. He, uh, he's, uh, I think he's probably still the, the leading, I don't know if he still is, but was a uh, leading three-point shooter in, in league history, I think. Quite yeah, a player. He- Tell me a little bit about your hoops coaching career. I know you coached uh, you coached basketball for I believe uh, one year at Valley, um, but you know I think you you know football and basketball are kind of your kind of your deal. So tell me about that a little bit. Well, I'll tell you, I, yeah, I, I don't know how much I coached. I managed the program for a year. I I, I learned a lot about the work you guys do as a uh, as a uh, you know as basketball coaches during that time. You know, I did play. I played at St. Francis, and then. Uh, and then my uh, my basketball, one of my best basketball experiences really was at, at De Anza College. I bounced back and uh, to play football at, at De Anza. And this just goes to show you about how, you know, sports can be the same. That was my plan to play football there, see if it would maybe lead me back to Division One or something. Mm-hmm. And when it didn't work out great, I got a, a buddy of mine was playing on the basketball team at the time. And, uh, and they were coached by a legendary coach. Um, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and he later became the commissioner of, of the, the, you know, the SCBAL and, and so uh-huh. was Tony Nunez, it was a, a great experience. So he, anyways, he let me come out for, uh, for, you know, three days. He said, I'll you get three, get three days, Eric. And if you're top seven, I'll let you in. And if you're not, uh, you can just go on your way. That, that's great. And, uh, it was a good three day tryout. And so I got to play with them as a, you know, two sport college athlete with, uh, so anyways, I learned a lot through that, through that basketball experience, just playing there for, for coach. And, uh, and then when, when we came here at Valley, you know, it, it was a situation, our, our boys basketball program, uh, we, we hadn't been having success and, and we didn't have the number of kids coming out. I interviewed like eight people to, to, uh, to, to, to be the head coach. And mm-hmm. in the end, they just, all of them had great strengths, but, but I just really felt like, all right, right now I need to get more kids into our program and use the, the, the whole power of the athletic program. So basically I hired almost everybody I interviewed for some role on our staff. I took over as the head coach and then I let them all coach. And, uh, and I did that for a year where, uh, where we ended up bringing in Marcus Martinez, one of those people who was a graduate of the school to lead our program. And he did a great job of building, you know, support and energy, right. built the second freshman basketball team. And, uh, and had a fair amount of success with uh, with that. So, so I just sort of uh, I, I oversaw the program, let everybody else coach, and uh, and mostly administered and and led, um, you know, just led led the kept kept the heat away from them, so to speak, and allowed right. us to just really refocus our program with uh, with we we didn't even almost have a freshman team at the time, and we built it into two teams and some of that. So 
but man, I learned a lot about uh, about the the challenge of being a basketball coach during that year. Right. And that's just really helped to inform some of the things we've got to do, you know, as a school in the time since. Right. And, uh, you know, some members of that coaching staff have gone on to do really great things. The one that you mentioned, Marcus Martinez, is now no longer coaching, but he's been called to do something much different and, and, and super impactful, which is lead the walk program at Valley Christian Schools, which brings individuals or, or students and helps them do, you know, projects overseas and in and, and rural rural, rural places um, in small countries in Africa and Mexico and India um, and just provide them a platform to understand who God is, to understand that there's people out there that love them and it really changes the students. So, you know, he's called in a different way, but, you know, one of those leadership qualities that you have is just directing people to where they're supposed to be. And I've seen that uh, firsthand, you know, from my, you know, my eight years now at Valley Christian. Uh, switching gears just a little bit, you've been able to be in many different roles. Uh, number one, you're a parent. You know, you've had three children that have come through the program. They all played sports or were heavily into athletics, and they all finished their careers uh, there. Um, you've been an admitter, administer you know, administrator, meaning you've seen everything from the back end. You've also seen it from the coach's perspective. If you were to tell anybody what success would look like at the end of their time there, what does that mean from all of the perspectives that you have? Well, I, I think it really depends on, uh, you know, one of the things that I was taught uh, when I was really young is to treat people equal, but not the same. Everybody's got um, a different sort of path that they're on. And it's one of the things that, that from, from my perspective, at least, we're serving a wide range of kids here at the school. And so it's really, it's not going to be the same uh, for everyone. For some, for some kids, this is, this is their ticket. You know, sports is it's it. And, uh, right. and that opportunity to build a better life for themselves, get into college, pay for college. And, uh, and so in some cases, that's a part of the success journey. We have counselors who help you you know, get to the right spot to, to help you get into the college. For, for others, it's, uh, it's, it's maybe, uh, you know, just the, the experience of being a part of a team and learning all those values that are there. You know, I, I shared with the other day, it, it's, it's, for some, it's the, the physical fitness that comes of it. And I'm telling you, uh, my kids during this shutdown time, uh, I don't need to kick them out of the house to go work out. They know how to work out. And that's in large part, due to what's been happening on this campus, the work that TAP does in the HPC, the work that coaches like yourself have done, be more than just teaching them how to dribble a basketball, but to really instill some of this uh, fitness, this, this, these qualities of lifelong fitness you know, into them. Right. Um, I mean, that's a big part of it. And, uh, and that's been something that we've been beneficiaries of. So, you know, so I think it, it really kind of, for some it's the tutoring. You know, we have a, a program here, a REACH program here on campus, where kids get this extra uh, academic side that, uh, that they really need because, you know, organizing their lives is the challenge of it. And so I don't think it's a one size fits all, but, but right. everybody has a next step. And, uh, and so trying to get as, as broad based a, a support staff, you know, across the school, across our coaching staffs to be able to reach these kids in, in different, in different places, I mean, you know this as as the head of the basketball program. It mm -hmm. the kids have different needs, and right. uh, and so you have to have a diverse coaching staff that can meet those needs and push the buttons at the right time, whatever they are. So, so getting them to take the next step, I think, is a huge part of it. Right. Uh, so you know, being in so many capacities, you have to hire the coaches, but then you also have to hear the complaints from the parents. And then you've got the administration as well as the league that you have to, you know, follow the rules and, and live by the, you know, code of conduct and whatnot. What are some of the, uh, I would say, uh, you know, some of the difficulties with a position like yours? Well, I mean, one of the difficulties is just how competitive it is in our in our area. I mean, sometimes you, you're doing a great job or people are doing a great job and you just don't have the, the, the talent level to have a competitive success. And so, so being able to really discern what's going on inside of programs other than just the winning and losing right. is uh, it's, it's a difficulty that, uh, that exists. 
you know, the most important thing that I do is hire, hire men and women to coach our teams. And, uh, mm -hmm. and by far and away, uh, when we get the right people in these spots with a vision and, uh, and that are the right fit for that time, almost every problem goes away. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's not easy to do. It's not easy to, to you know, at the high school level, to really challenge coaches towards greatness, towards excellence, and and hold hold coaches accountable when uh, when the rewards aren't uh, aren't super high financially, obviously. And so it's like, uh, well, well, that's that's a challenge because we're going to demand excellence. We're going to demand that our coaches work really, really hard and uh, and achieve greatness. And uh, and yet you want to support them too because you know it's not always the easiest thing. It it, right. it can be lonely as you're competing and and trying to find your way through through that level of success. So, so I think that can be a challenge at time when, you know, it's just like coaching. When, when do kids need to be really pushed if they're maybe not getting the reward of playing time that they want or the success yeah. that they want? You still got to drive them outside their comfort zone. And I think it's the same thing in this role that, that uh, it's my job to hold coaches accountable and, and to right. expect greatness um, even when, uh, when sometimes it's not easy. And so hopefully there's the – you know, the, the pat on the back, hopefully there's those, you know, that, that coaches can feel that from time to time and, and feel supportive of their vision uh, that they have for the program. Yeah, it's such a, a slippery slope. And, you know, this is a two part question. But we've had conversations like this before. And especially, you know, your daughter has played for me. Um, and so, you know, you know, it from a parent's perspective as well. And the coach, we've always been We've always had that, you know, we have to win, we have to win, we have to win, we have to win. Now we're not going to try to win at all costs or, uh, you know, deter the rules or anything like that. But how much or how important is winning? You know, because that's the reason why we're playing the game. You play to win the game. You know, the, the famous phrase, speech from Herm Edwards, right? But we also have this other pool, you know, with our faith, with just being excellent and, you know, Excellence just means your uh, best effort. And if it's not good enough, then you can be satisfied with that. But if it isn't, then you need to increase your effort. So tell me, how important is winning? Well, I think it's usually important. You know, I mean, I, I think really a plan for winning is what's most important. And so mm -hmm. once you put a plan together, once you have the vision for, for what it for what's coming, I mean, to me, that's by far the most important thing. Again, this is a bit cliche, but the winning takes care of itself when you're doing the right things. Because we uh, all want to be Bill Wal a Bill Walsh adage, huh? Yeah, exactly. We all want to be around greatness, and uh, and when you're doing special things, when you put programs together that can serve kids, our school's an example. We have a human performance center to serve their bodies. We have a the walk program to serve their their souls. We have the reach program. Uh, you, you know, I mean, there's just so many things for kids. I've got amazing coaches on this campus. Kids are going to want to be a part of that. And uh, right. now that didn't happen overnight when you came on, however many years ago, eight years ago or something, and it was you and two kids down in the gym, you know, playing <laughs> basketball, and you, you open the gym up, and uh, and it's tough to get kids in there, and you're using your network to bring people in and create that excitement. It's like, all right, I know winning's on its way. There's a plan for success that's there. And I can buy into that plan. I can support that plan, and then try to make their make make their make it a you know a way to 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 achieve that that greatness. And now that doesn't always mean that that you, you know it's it's not a, a you know a path that, that goes you know directly up all the time. Right. But uh, but the characteristics of winning programs that's what's in our girls basketball program right now. Hopefully our athletic program, and then over time when the situation's right, it really takes off. Uh, our baseball program's not doing a whole lot different than it was doing for, for 30 years. Right. But, uh, but they've got great players now in their program, and they're having an incredible amount of, of winning success. But the framework has been there for 30 years of, uh, of in those programs. And so that's what I'm really looking for and trying to encourage our coaches on that path with both my insights, hopefully, and, and sometimes expectations. I right. I really love your point about having a plan in place and then trying to execute that plan. I know during our interview process, you wanted to know, uh, basically tell, tell a story of what's going to happen in the program. And, you know, I was prepared for that, luckily. Um, what are some of the things that you're looking for when you're hiring a coach, you know, or uh, hiring ahead of a program? Because there's so many different things that come into play 
but what are some of the things that you would look for? Well, I, I think I always tell people this, the most, the most important thing is the person, the right person for the job. And that's so many different things. Sometimes it's experience, sometimes it's a younger person, sometimes it's that vision, but I'm, I'm always just trying to really discern who is the person for this. Uh, your your situation is a good one, one where there wasn't experience coaching girls, but there was uh, the, the things in place to be able to build that program and the the temperament I felt like to be really successful in that in that regard. Um, there's a vision that I'm looking for, uh, some some level of, uh, of of obviously you know the experience is sort of a given. Everybody knows what, what am I going to talk basketball with you? How to break a two two one press? If we got to have that conversation, I mean I, I don't need to know the basketball side of a right. of a head varsity coach because again you don't get through the door unless you have that level of basketball knowledge. Right. And from there, it's, it's well, can they do these things to build a program? You know very well the assistants that coaches can bring in. The assistant coaches are a huge part. I've been an assistant coach for 25 years. I know how important they are mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to a, a program that's there. So do you have that network? Um, do you have the relationships with the referees, with the broader basketball community? Um, and, uh, and then the community that's there where – where the reputation exists, where, where parents are gonna to wanna to send their kids there. Um, and so I look for all of those types of things and just some administrative parts of it. I talk almost nothing about the actual sport, right? Because I've, I'll check out a coach before that, people right. who know the game, that's who I wanna to talk to. I wanna to talk to those people who know the game and, uh, and they tell me, what does Patrick Judge say about Chris McSwain as a coach? You know what I mean? And, uh, and you get his blessing, well, what am I gonna spend all my time talking hoops with you for? Right. Uh, one of the things that I, that I always think about with you is you're always forward thinking, you know, and you've uh, challenged me to stretch my thinking about not what's actually going on now, but what's going to happen. What are the what are the stepping stones in place that you're going to have to, that, you know, look from a distance? Where do you want to get to? All right. Now you figure out how you get there. And it's more of the re uh, reverse engineering the process instead of thinking about, oh, we got to take care of this, or we got to take care of this, or we need uniforms, or we need worry about where you want to get to and then take your course of action from there. Um, and, you know, one of the, the biggest compliments I can pay you is you stretch people intellectually to get them to think outside of the box. You know, you're, you're in a position where you're having to think about all these things, you know, and you're looking at it like this. And most of the time the coaches are looking at this. So if there's any coaches or people in administration that are listening to this, I think that is one thing that you can, can, can really take from this conversation is look at, look at the entire piece of the puzzle and figure out where all those pieces need to be. And you've, you've done a terrific job, you know, over your uh, 20 plus year career. I appreciate that. And it's one of the things that, it, you know, again, it, it's setting the right framework as a part of it as well. Again, taking your specific situation, it's great being a young married guy with no kids and you can yeah. work, you can run a club, you can coach 12 teams, you can teach six PE classes, you can be the head girls varsity right. coach, you know, do all that. But it's like, again, looking at that broader perspective of, hey, here's what's coming. You know right. what, when, uh, when your house starts filling up with kids, yep. it's going to be different. And so part of my role is to try to create, to keep guys Kid, uh, coaches who are talented like yourself well, what's that plan what's that sustainability plan for what it's going to be like in 10 years and uh, right. and so that's one of the things I've learned Dr. Doherty's been that way for me and I've sort of traveled that journey and it's super important that there's some sustainability uh, to this whole coaching grind. No doubt uh, you've had we've talked about the different areas in which you uh, you know you have your touch on but I want to talk about coaching your son. You know, you coach your son in football and seeing that process and then also watching other coaches coach your kids. I know I directly had that. I'm so thankful we got through that. You um, and me both. <laughs> <laughs> I know you were marking off the calendar as well, yeah. but uh, you have two terrific young ladies and your son Luke is an awesome young man and they made it easy for, I think, all of us during a in a situation that could have been uh, awkward, you know, or yeah. a little bit different. Um, but tell me first about coaching your son. And then secondly, about, you know, seeing other kids or other coaches coach your kids. 
Well, it's been super interesting. And so, so, you know, I coached, I coached all of them. I coached four years of T-ball. That's another claim to fame I had that, uh, you know, so that was it. I was their T-ball coach. Yeah. And then from there on, uh, uh, you know, I didn't, I, I not only didn't coach them in anything, I didn't, I didn't say a word. I don't coach from the stands. I don't, I don't cheer. I don't say hustle or run or shoot or swing or, you know, I just sort of let the coaches do it. And so that's a, you know, a bit of a, an advantage that I think I had in preparing for all this that, you know, that other than T-ball, I was thankful to have really good coaches for, for all of my kids growing up mm -hmm. and, and just a network to put them in that spot. So I got some practice on that. You know, with and so with Luke, when he came into, you know, into the football program, I stayed away as freshman and sophomore year. And uh, and, I, you know, I wouldn't be on the sidelines during games. I'd, I'd sit in the stands like every other parent and and stay away from the practices the best I could. And, uh, and I tell a story that when we brought him up his sophomore year, my son was a, a, a small guy when he was a kid. He was the, you know, four foot something, 95 pound freshman trying to be a football player in a in a, in a school like ours. And, uh, and so, but he grew, you know, as, as the years went on, but he was always fighting for it. Um, but when he came up in uh, the end of, you know, for the playoffs, you know, I, I remember distinctly uh, during a drill that, uh, that, that he, he, he said, what should I do coach or, or, you know, something like that to me and called me coach. And that was his way of opening the door to say, dad, uh, I'm ready for you to coach me now. And so I right. coached him. And, uh, and so I appreciated the wisdom and his words because we didn't really know how we would we talk to each other, would we not? And, uh, and so he asked me that question. And so I always strive to, to be his coach um, and the best I could. You know, I, as I've told you, I, I, I view it through the eyes of being their dad first and foremost. I've never, I, I never have been able to get that out. I hopefully see the game broadly. Uh, and can see the bigger picture, but I see it through the eyes of being their dad. And, uh, and it's taught me so much about the importance of um, just the importance of, of, of looking at every young person through the eyes of their parents. And, uh, and so I don't think it's a bad thing to, to look at these kids through the eyes of their parents. In fact, it's been one of the greatest lessons I've had. And, and not only that, but pursuing the winning. I'll tell you a story about Luke. Uh, you know, he was the personal protector on the punt team, and uh, yeah. and we were playing one particular opponent for the league championship, a huge game, and they would send uh, they would send Division One guys after the punts all the time. So I went all week long. Should I take him out? You know, I mean, there's 300 pounders coming at him. Right. And, and so just going back and forth, you know, do I trust him? Do I, you know, is it his job or do I replace him? What am I going to do? And I ended up, you know, preparing two people, and uh, and in in the third quarter of the game, we punted several times, and. Uh, and in the third quarter of the game, they they blocked the punt and uh, they returned it for a touchdown that changed the game. And I'm looking for the iPad on the sidelines, and I'm mad at him because you know I'm assuming it's his fault. And uh, and I, I did replace him later in the game and put in another personal protector. Well, imagine when I watched the film at the end, it wasn't his fault. It was my stupid plan that put people in the wrong spot that was responsible for the punt being blocked. And so I was just mm. learning and. Uh, and the most amazing part of this, so he was the punt protector for the rest of the year and did all that. And in the state championship game that year, we went all the way there and against Madison, uh, second quarter of the game, there was a punt and, uh, and you know, one guy knocked the ball out of, uh, out of their return guy's hands and, uh, and somebody, we fell on the kick and uh, on the punt for a huge thing in the game. And, and I was telling the guy on my headsets, I think that was Luke that recovered it. Was that Luke? Did he really recover that? And yeah. uh, and how it all played out is his best friend, one of his best friends knocked the ball out. Luke shoved this uh, Division I player out of the way and made this amazing fumble recovery uh, in that moment. And, uh, and for me, it was just about getting the right people in the right spots. And that was what the lesson was. He deserved it. He earned it. And, uh, and I don't know whether if he wasn't my son, if he would have been in that spot or not. Mm -hmm. But, man, I've learned for coach to get kids in the right spots and the winning is going to take care of itself. The success is going to take care of itself. And I've tried to remember that since then, watching you coach my girls and watching volleyball coaches coach my older daughter, I know you guys love them. I know you have their best interests at heart. And my job is really to trust you, um, even though there will be moments where I disagree. I'm looking yeah. at it as their dad. And, uh, but in the end, it's not my job to agree or disagree as their dad with the work that their coaches are doing. My job is to trust you and, uh, and communicate with you. And so, so that's what I've always tried to do with watching them. And, 
and I've appreciated the opportunity here on this campus with the people who have coached my kids, mm -hmm. um, that when the time to communicate is there, you're not afraid to shoot straight with them. Coach Whitmill's not afraid to tell them the truth. Hey, here's where you're at. Right. And uh, do I always agree with it? Well, no, but I trust you. And I appreciate that honest feedback of, uh, of that path and that opportunity to buy, to, uh, for them to, to get a role for themselves. And that, as their dad, has been amazing. And, uh, and okay, here's the deal. Rebecca's role was to set screens. You know what I mean? That's not right. the greatest role in the world. But when Coach McSwain needed someone to set a screen, and he knew who he could count she on. You know? Definitely yeah. could do that. <laughs> That's right. And uh, she wear them out. Uh, and right. so it's like, okay, so Luke's role as a, as a, a personal protector on the punt or, uh, or, or Lauren's role in leading devotions or, or, or you know, uh, changing defenses or, or whatever it is that you need them. And so I've always appreciated that. I think it's important for coaches to give kids the path to the role. And then it's up to kids. Do they want to accept that role or do the work to change their role? All right, you want to be the three-point shooter? Well, get up a 1,000 shots, man. You know what I mean? Be able to knock them down. The numbers are going to support that. And uh, so I think it's harder for kids. The, the bigger the coach's, the, the, the coaches, uh, kid has, the harder it is, right? Because for me, their roles are, are you know, are, are role players and doing the things that, you, that the coaches need. So that's been a, a blessing in some ways for me with my kids. Um, you know, Coach, Coach Steve Cotton's son uh, was a three-point shooter. That was his role. Yeah. And uh, that's a role that more people like. Well, why did he have the role? Because he was the best shooter. Right. Uh, but and when he'll, you're – He'll tell you that, by the way. Yeah, I know. You got that. I know. Believe me. He's told me that. That's great. <laughs> he, uh, but anyways, but when you're a parent sitting in the stand and if you think that your child is the best three-point shooter – Nobody's nobody. None of the parents want their kid to be the best screener, you know. So, uh, so there there wasn't pushback on the coaches in that regard. Um, but I think it's challenging for those coaches whose kids are the quarterback or the three point shooter or the pitcher on the softball team or or whatever it is. That's it, it's hard because right. I think they're. I think you're gonna you know just warning you as a as a young you know a parent of young athletes that'll be coming. You're going to be their dad first and foremost, and uh, right. uh, and being able to navigate that part, step into the role it, it, as their t-ball coach. I was their t-ball coach because their first experience as athletics was going to be the way I wanted it to be, and uh, and from there I stepped away for the most part because I was fortunate that I got to hire men and women who were going to give them an experience that I wanted it to be as well. Right. And so I'm just so thankful for for that you know ability that I have here um, to hire men and women to coach my kids like that because really I everybody is you, you know is somebody's Luke you know and yeah. uh and so I need to hire people who are going to treat their kids you know like treat the kids the athletes like their own kids right well you have a unique perspective because one you are a coach so you you have that respectful nature about yourself where it's like hey I just got to try to fit fit these kids in wherever they're going to best suit the team and secondly you get to hire them so you've already got that trust uh, in those coaches if you know parents are going to be parents to your earlier points what are some examples or things that they can possibly do to understand to sit back and let the kid play that whole situation out because it ends up working out in the very end. I think we can, you know, both attest that both your girls had a good experience. Neither one of them were stars, but they carved out a role for their, you know, for themselves on the team and they felt good about that. Did they want more of a role? Sure. Everybody does. You know, I want more money from you and, uh, and so forth and so on. Like we're always going to be trying for more, but I think everybody went away satisfied with that role. Can you, touch on that from the parents, you know, from an administrative perspective to, you know, the parents that are listening? Well, I, I think one of the big things is just, first of all, knowing what it is that you want. Back to the earlier part of it, enjoying the journey is so, so important. Get to the other end of this, you know, the other side of it with the, the kids being, you know, uh, mostly complete with their athletic experience. Our memories, you know, uh, uh, we've had great memories and great memories of trips and road trips and hotels in Stockton and my son putting verses under his eyes like Team Tim Tebow did and uh, yeah. uh, he you know uh, we, we have great memories the journey and everybody knows this right 
and I know this, but man, sometimes just getting so caught up in the moment and, and really avoiding, you know, one of the things for me is I got away from trying to decide whether the coaches were doing right by my son and daughter. In the end, it didn't matter that much. I think I've shared this with you. You, you know, uh, it, you're either going to be a, a great coach in their memory or you're not. It, it, as the administrator of our athletic program, it matters. But as their dad, it doesn't matter. They're going to have great bosses and less great bosses. They're going to think that they should have got a promotion and, and not. But it's not my job to make sure that they get their promotion. My job is to parent them through that and through those right. times when, yeah, you know what? I think you should have a, a, a bigger role, too. What are we going to do about that? What's going to happen um, as a part of that rather than, yeah, they're, they're you know, it, it, you're right. They're, you're being wronged and all that. Let's parent them through this type of thing. So I've, I've learned that. I've learned in the end things tend to work their way out. Luke's story on the punt return or my girl's story I shared with you when I was dropping Rebecca off at University of Portland. She said powerful words to me. She said, Dad, I'd go back and I'd do it all over again. And it's yeah. like, what a great thing as her basketball coach but also as her dad, you know, to, to navigate the challenges of all of this, to get to the end of, if I had it to do all over again, I would. And, uh, and so that's what I'm looking for. And that doesn't mean there weren't moments when, uh, when we were crying together, when we were yelling together, when we right. were cheering together, um, all the ups and downs. In the end, she'd do it all over again. And it's like, that is a great perspective. So getting away from that and getting away from thinking it's my job to get coach to understand what my what he should be doing for my son or daughter or she should be doing okay. for my son or daughter that's not my job my job is to get my son or daughter to understand clearly from the coach um at, you know what the expectations are and whether or not i agree with the role that you have to offer them or uh or your decision on the role that you give them i, I don't care that much you know yeah. that's not my job and uh and so just getting really clear on what my job as their dad is um, and was. And uh, once I got around that, 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 it, that it just became a lot easier that it's my job to process that piece of it and, uh, and maybe nudge them in that direction, the direction they need to go as well. Right. One of my mentors always had this saying, you know, always have an open heart and an open mind. And that's kind of what I've tried to be as a coach, you know, I've, I've learned this over the years, especially coaching girls. And we had our, we, I don't know if, uh, if, if Lauren or Chu told you, we had our senior just, you know, lunch right after the season ended, uh, right before we got, you know, quarantined and locked down. But it was uh, the three seniors. And, you know, I just go over, hey, you know, what was good? What was, what was bad? What was things we can, we can do differently? And, you know, I, I, I would touch on the playing time a lot, you know, letting them know. And they're like, coach, you don't have to do it that much. And I was like, huh, maybe, maybe we don't, you know, maybe it changes by year. Who knows? But, you know, I just try to put it out there and let everybody know because I know that's, a, you know, that's a, a thin line to be on. But as long as you have it with the open heart and an open mind, those conversations, I think you can you can be successful for the most part. And you're not going to make everybody happy. A lot of the times you'll look back on it and be like, OK, now we understand. I know from a from a former player, many, many coaches. Now I look back. And, OK, I get it now. It makes more sense to me. And at the end of the day, all that other stuff really didn't matter. But I did learn some things along the way. Uh, switching gears just a little bit. Uh, tell me about how you've been able to, the good news is you, you've been in a position where you can go to work and you get to see your kids every single day. Um, but how have you involved your immediate family, you know, uh, your wife and your three children and ingratiate them into uh, your world every single day? You've done a very good job of making that open to them. And also, I think you've done a great job of bringing other kids from the campus to your home. You know, some of the favorite stories that the girls tell is, you know, hanging out at Eric's house. They don't call you Mrs. Schoenberg, they call you Eric. That's my face, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so, so it, it goes back a long way. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that, you know, one of the things that I learned early on was that the kids, uh, my kids were having an amazing experience just tagging along with me. And so, mm -hmm. You try to create an athletic program where everybody gets that experience. We started doing that early on in uh, 
in, in the program. But, uh, but one of the things um, that, that we started to do, uh, you know, like you said, was just be a, you know, be a part, have them be a part of everything that's, uh, everything that's going on. We opened our home for Bible studies, uh, hmm. you know, uh, in the football program. And, and it, it was, everybody had a role in that, whether it was making the, um, you know, making the cookies or my wife would make the dinners and she gets to tell the kids about, uh, you know, about what, uh, you know, what, you know, hand the ball to the, the official when they score a touchdown um, and that type of thing, all the stuff that matters for her. So it was really been a, a, a you know, a family affair. And it's, it's quite remarkable, really. Sometimes you don't know. We were having one of our quarantine conversations the other day around the table about asking the kids, well, what are your favorite sports memories? And, uh, and you know, just being a part of the Valley Christian community for all these years. And, and before you start, that, none yeah. of them were in a game. Yeah, no, exactly right. And it's like, and it's, it's not even, I mean, some of them were when I was coaching basketball and just doing something different there or in the crowd or, you know, the stuff that they're seeing, it's, it's amazing to get their perspective on uh on all of that and it was just it was just even different than the bonding and the you know some of the stuff that i that i knew would be the trips or that type of thing but you know the heroes they've made along the way it's like wow what an amazing way just a blessing i've had to have my kids grow up it, it's been intentional right because I, I i've never worked a day in my life really um but i'm i i, I work 24 7 365 so they've grown up in gyms and fields and courts and uh and meeting coaches and kids hugging them and uh, and so it's just been amazing and and so they they they've grown up that's been a part of what we've done and uh, and I think as they've moved their way through it's been just a natural extension to try to as my wife and I contemplate what it's like as as the kids have left the house and Luke's gone on to college and Rebecca's gone on to college it's like wow we have this part of our heart to uh, to keep sharing with kids and and so that's what's been you know been a piece of this of having whether it's the girls basketball team over or or the you know the football guys over it's just it's it's a it's just a our heart is our home has always been valley christian mm -hmm. it's just now it's gotten bigger you know when we're you know we're a couple miles from campus here too so it's it's nice that you know you, you live in gilroy or you live you know up the peninsula or something it's a it's a nice place you know, to be able to duck into after practice or, you know, not have to drive so early in the morning. So, uh, so it's just been, uh, it's been cool to be, our, our home has always been Valley Christian. Um, and now over the past couple of years, we've just had, uh, you know, more, more kids around. All right. So you've been at the school for over 20 years. I believe you got there in 97. Is that correct? 97. And, you know, so tell me, what is, uh, what is fulfilling to you still? And, you know, what are some of your goals? You're soon to be an empty nester here. And, uh, you know, what are your goals as you progress into the next part of your career? Well, it's so crazy because one of my goals was to, you know, have some time where I slow down a little bit, right? That was one of the mm -hmm. things I was thinking, uh, you know, here in December and read a book and, you know, just slow life down a little bit. And like the rest of the world, I'm, I'm sort of done with that. You know what I mean? I'm ready to get back to, uh, to, to grinding a bit more, but, uh, but I think we'll do a little bit of that and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, travel a little bit more is, is something that we, we think a little bit about, but, but in large part, it's transitioning our home to find a way to, to, uh, to, you know, just to have more kids in our house. And what's that going to look like? We don't really know. Uh, you know, sometimes kids come back as this has shown us. We've got a full house now. You can take my two if you need to. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what it all means. And, uh, and, you know, I got nephews across the street and we've got an extended family. And, uh, and so we'll just, we'll just sort of see. I, I, uh, my life has been, you know, my ministry and my work and my coaching and, and our school and all of that. I don't, I don't really anticipate that changing. Uh, but it'll be, it'll be some different ways and, uh, and just different ways that I can serve. What can I do? I became a, uh, a, a fill in, uh, you know, a video guy for our girls basketball team this year. And, uh, and so who knows, you know what I mean? Just for me, different ways that I can serve. I, you know, I might learn to do the shot clock or learn to do, I won't be an announcer. I know that, but, uh, but what, what things can we do around sports? I always joke with people that I'm going to become a, 
uh, a basketball official. I wasn't a very good basketball coach, but uh, uh, but I you know I can uh, I can I can do a, a freshman basketball game or something. Um, so we'll see if I uh, if I ever actually do that. But I could be one of those guys when I get into my my 60s there, you know, who uh, you know walk up and down the court and uh, and crack jokes with the, the parents or something. That would be an interesting conversation with you and I. Uh, yeah. We have a, I have a special relationship with all officials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think I'll. I'll get to. Uh, I don't think I'll ever get to that level. I, you got to be able to walk up and down the court. Uh, these guys who can run up and down the court. That that's better than I'll ever be. Right. So tell me about any. Uh, you know, you got so many buckets in your life. What are some of the interests and hobbies that you like to do? And you know, if somebody never had a conversation with you. Well, like you, like you, uh, like most of the people who come and, and do the podcast with you, a lot of it is 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 formed into one for me. I do have a, uh, you know, backyard we call EJ's there, where uh, where I love to entertain people, and I would say that's something people don't know. We uh, we host uh, a wide variety of people. You know, Cheers is a show where people come around and mm-hmm. uh, and they talk and tell stories, and you get this wide range of characters who uh, who comes back there. So. Uh, so I would say that would be one thing that's a part of uh, a part of our life that we have this uh, this backyard set up where we cook and we barbecue and watch TV, and uh, and I've got an amazing cast of characters, great friends that uh, that come back there, and uh, you know we get to tell stories and tell jokes. I you know my brother across the street, it's been amazing. You know in football season after every Friday night uh, mm-hmm. that I've got the St. Francis crew and my goddaughter. Um, Catherine, who uh, who's the head coach's daughter, and uh, and baseball coaches, and then our Valley Christian staff. It's just this again. Some of the stuff that I know makes coaching. You know, I see it with your crew that runs around, where you get this wide group of people who are uh, who are part of your extended family that get to come together and uh, and just debrief, right? And whether it's the official you were chewing out 20 minutes before, or the 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 other team's coach, or your assistant coaches. Um, or your family, and it's uh, it's something I admire about about the group that you run with. That it's broader, you know, it's a basketball community, but it's broader than that. It's not just the Valley Christian basketball community. Right. So, anyways, that's what that's something we do in our backyard, and uh, and that extends into our neighborhood. Yeah. Um, my my T-ball years, I've coached every kid in our neighborhood. I'll tell you those four years, uh, and so those families make their way through our backyard, and uh, and we laugh and we tell jokes and. Uh, and nobody gets behind my bar, though, Chris. I'll tell you that. That's the okay. first thing people learn. They try right. to get around the backside uh, to be there. But, you know, like uh, Sam Malone or something, I need, uh, right. I need my space back there so I can, uh, I can run around and you have to ask permission to get back there. Well, when I get the invite, I'd love to come by, and I, I wouldn't yeah. dare step on another man's bar. So. Love it. Very true. So, uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a good time back there. Well, really appreciate the conversation. I think people are going to get a insight into your world, the the many buckets that you have. I mean, you know, what a what a great profession. You've done a terrific job in your in your spot, and you'll continue to have success uh, if you keep hiring people like me. I guess you got that right. Well, I tell you this. I mean, uh, I'm not afraid to tell you when uh, when I think you can do better. I know. And, uh, I, and, know. Uh, I know exactly. Uh, but you're doing great with this podcast and uh, and my wife and I are thankful uh, just for the work you're doing, you know, personally in our basketball program with the kids. And you talk about playing time all the time because you want kids to be happy. You want them to, uh, you know, them to know how much you care. My girls know how much you care and, and how much your staff cares, you know, about them. And it's just been uh, it's just been a blessing for us to have navigated, you know, that part of the program with you. And uh, and I look forward to, to to the great things coming in the Valley Christian Girls basketball program. So we got, uh, we got big things ahead of us. Definitely. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate you, Coach. Good talking to you. All right. Thank you for listening to the Beyond the Buckets podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and share the show with your friends. And until next time, take care.